Hi, Kathy. Hi, Lee. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kathleen Hurley, and I am the manager at Enigma Forensics. We are really excited to host this presentation about the keys to unlocking medical records. Uh, and so, so shortly after the presentation, we will be sending out a Google survey to obtain each of your ARDC numbers so we could send you the MCL credit um, for participating in this event. Enigma Forensics is a cyber forensic company with over 20 years of experience in specializing and examining data. We have direct hands-on experience with electronic medical record software systems, including Synapse, PAX, DICOM, Cerner, Meditech, Epic, Forward Advantage, and IMD. We partner with attorneys to help them win cases. Which brings me to the point of all of us being here. Let me welcome Enigma Forensics President and CEO Lee Newbecker. Lee is CISSP certified. I know it's a mouthful, but that means he's certified information system security professional. Take it away, Lee. Thanks, thanks Kathy. Okay. Let's see. So today we're going to be talking about the keys to unlocking electronic medical record audit trails. Uh, we have a mixture of people on the webinar today. I know some people represent healthcare providers, other people represent uh, litigants involved with medical malpractice. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about how the process works. We'll begin with discussing some of the some of the scenarios where electronic medical records are relevant and important. Um, you know, if you're suspecting that the elderly has been abused in a nursing home, uh, that could be uh, important to know. Uh, records of care, when medications were provided, whether or not uh, patients were neglected, uh, all of that information can be discerned from reviewing the electronic medical record history. Um, in some cases, there's allegations about not providing appropriate care over time um, or the staff providing the wrong type of care. Uh, so many of these cases become litigated and um, various medical record experts or uh, clinical experts get involved. We'll be talking about later today about how you really wanna start with getting command of the EMR or electronic medical records so that it can be efficiently reviewed, not only by uh, you and your team, but also by any experts that might be retained to assist with the case. Um, it's important to understand uh, that there might be discussions between staff, uh, physicians and nurses and whatnot that aren't in the progress notes or printed medical record. So we'll be covering that in a little bit. Um, Allegations about uh, harm to children by parents or healthcare providers, that's also relevant as well. Um, in some cases, we've seen situations where the chart reflects a certain color of bruising many days after a child was admitted into a, a facility uh, for care, but the coloration of bruises often can suggest that the bruising happened before entry into a facility. Well, in a case like that, knowing whether or not the child was bathed and, and whether it was reported early on can help determine was the child injured in the healthcare provider's uh, place of care or did it happen prior to admission? So what typically happens when you ask for the electronic medical record for your, your patient or your chart, um, the healthcare providers will often produce it in the most uh, unhelpful way. They might print it. Uh, if it's printed or dumped to a PDF that's flattened, it's not searchable. It might be included with lots of redundant information, out of order, sorted, not intuitively from uh, oldest to newest, but backwards. Um, oftentimes, the, the version revision history of the progress notes are completely missing. So, you know, for instance, if you have an epic uh, EMR production. With EPIC, they have the ability to enable 
uh, the specific version number so that you can determine the revision history over time. And that isn't always what's included in the printed report that gets produced. Um, some reports will have unnecessary filters. For instance, if only named providers are, are shown and you don't see a mixture of healthcare staff uh, providing care to a patient, that might suggest that the report was produced with only the name key uh, healthcare providers included. And so when you're requesting electronic medical records, you really wanna be very specific to say, use no other filter other than the patient identifier or the patient medical record number. Uh, date filters and whatnot, um, you know, narrowly uh, defining the date and time when the patient was in the, the hospital or healthcare facility might result in filtering out of important records that show that the chart might have been modified or manipulated well after the patient's departure uh, from the facility and after the patient experienced some type of harm. Um, another thing I see, it, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah. Another thing I see that happens sometimes is in addition to different filters, such as like filtering by date or filtering by healthcare provider or department, um, sometimes uh, the, the filters aren't displayed on the reports and you really want to be able to understand what filters are used. Uh, one other filter that might uh, be used without your knowledge is whether or not the record is considered confidential. Uh, confidential would suppress the record oftentimes from appearing on the, the printed medical record report. So you want active, inactive, all version history, confidential, you want the entirety. Um, another important thing that, that is relevant in many cases involves the communications between healthcare providers. Uh, with EPIC, you have the ability, uh, and with Cerner, you have the ability for routing of communications, um, either almost like an email system within the healthcare system or something known as sticky notes, which is basically like an instant messaging platform between healthcare staff about a patient. And there's documentation out there where hospitals say that sticky notes are not part of the medical, the legal record. Well, HIPAA requires that those all that data be retained. So the data is in there, it's in the backend database, or you have to inspect the, the hospital information system to be able to document it on, on photo or in video. Um, another thing that we see a lot of are records that, that are entered in after the fact. When you enter a record into a, a hospital information system, you can list the reported date and time of the event but that is oftentimes different than when the record was actually saved and created in, in the system. So we'll talk about that more as we go through. Uh, first, I'd like to cover some important concepts and terms that are relevant to electronic medical records in uh, medical malpractice litigation. Uh, EMR, electronic medical records, uh, is synonymous with EHR, the electronic health record. Uh, hospital information system is sometimes referred to as HIS, uh, and that's like Cerner or Epic or Meditech or whatever software system is being used to manage the patient care and store their electronic medical record. Uh, PACS is specific to video photo types uh, involved with the documentation of electronic medical records as it pertains to things like MRIs, x-rays, videos of surgeries, and so on. And um, each of these systems often have their own audit logs separate from the HIS system. EPHI is Electronic Protected Health Information. Um, that's what all this stuff is about. Data dictionaries are an abstract or key that help you to cross-reference the initials of the healthcare provider or the department or procedures or, or lab test results to the friendly name. And if you're working one of these cases, you want to include in your request for production, a production of the data dictionary so that you can make sense of the, the charts and records that are produced to you. Another thing that I like to ask for when I'm getting electronic medical records is to request that those that data be produced in what's known as a delimited format, which is like a spreadsheet format, sometimes known as comma delimited. That allows you to manipulate the data 
much more easily and filter and aggregate and do things that can help you see into what's happening quickly without having to review uh, oftentimes tens of thousands of pages. Native files refers to um, the file as it exists. Like if there's a, a transcription um, that's saved as a WAV file uh, that has the original doctor's notes, um, asking for the native file of the transcriptions would give you the actual file that was recorded as opposed to some uh, transcription of the file. Audit trail or audit logs, uh, HIPAA requires that data be stored about the use, of the creation, modification, and access of electronic health records. And these audit logs will show when things are added, updated, modified. Uh, the logs and audit trails as produced often don't answer the key question about what changes are happening. And usually I get involved with helping uh, the parties understand, well, what really happened? What was a real revision history? When did it occur? Who did it? From what computer? At what date and time? Was data deleted? Was it added? And, and that's very relevant to many medical malpractice cases. When we're uh, analyzing data, some of the things we can do, we can take the electronic medical records, if they're produced in a delimited format, we can quickly prepare aggregate summary charts that might show how many minutes did, or how many interactions with the EMR did the supervising physician have? Um, what dates and time were the records looked at? When did modifications occur? If modifications occurred after a patient's discharge, which I see quite a lot of times, that can be suggestive of efforts to fabricate the medical record history. Uh, when we get the data, uh, in addition to trying to get it into a delimited or spreadsheet format, we like to make sure that the data is ocr which is optical character tech recognition that allows for searching on key concepts, names of providers, dates and times, and so on. And all of that can be very important as you work a case. So HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. And why this is important is all the hospital information system providers, they have to certify that their software is HIPAA compliant. Otherwise, a hospital's receiving Medicare reimbursement wouldn't be able to use the software. So the presumption should be that any healthcare organization that is receiving Medicare funding is compliant with the rules of HIPAA. And we'll talk through what that requires here. First, HIPAA requires that there be an app application audit trail audit trails that show when the EMR was open, access, closed, created, edited uh, the original value, replacement value, who updated it, when, from what computer, whether it was deleted. There's system level audit trails, which has to do with the log ons of the user to the system, when they logged on, what computer, was it the nurse's station? Was it the computer that was actually bedside with the patient? So all of that can be relevant, especially in establishing whether or not a healthcare provider was with the patient at an important time. User audit log trails uh, monitor uh, the user activity within a specific EPHI application. Uh, it records events, what commands were issued, and so on. Healthcare organizations must retain these records for at least six years. And typically, if there's an issue where litigation is involved, at the point in time that they're notified, their risk management committee will collect the records and make a preservation of the available data. Uh, some states have stricter retention requirements uh, beyond six years, and in those cases, the state rules should apply according to HIPAA. Other requirements of HIPAA include the following, uh, when a user logs on, when changes are made to the databases, when users are added, access level for each user, what rights they have, uh, the file access by the user, logins to the operating system, firewall logs, anti-malware logs, and more. So there's a lot of requirements that hospitals are compliant and other healthcare organizations receiving Medicare funding follow these, these requirements. Here's an example of what an audit trail log looks like. I know it's, it's probably a little bit difficult to see all of this, but what we see, this, this one's a Meditech. Um, and what you'll see here is there's a run date, the date and time the the report was ran, uh, the runtime, uh, the username, um, 
the database, the specific database being accessed and who the patient was. Then across the top, you have different data columns such as date, time, the user, what action, were they modifying, exporting, viewing, um, the description of the action. Um, then you have the device being used to access it. <clears throat> it also shows here that there's a confidential flag on certain records which may or may not be produced. Um, and then there's ability for someone to, you know, Dr. Smith could enter something and emulate another user. And you don't often see uh, the notion that someone else emulated another user when you're viewing the progress note or printed chart. Uh, so the audit trail is important. Now, unfortunately, this audit trail doesn't show you the specific changes being made. And oftentimes what's necessary is you actually have to get direct in-camera inspection of the, the Meditech or other HIS system to be able to record and document uh, what the care provider sees. <clears throat> so when you're preparing to work with your expert, um, I always recommend that you start off with making a notable timeline of events at the front end uh, to lay out the key dates and times, what the allegations are. If you're the hospital and you're hiring us or the insurance company, you wanna have this timeline as well so that we can quickly assess and, and let you be aware of what the medical records reflect and help you to make an informed decision that relates to risk in, in your, your matter that you're defending against. Organizing the expert, uh, the documents to provide to the experts is important. Uh, getting a copy of the complaint, any request to produce responses or interrogatories or replies. That data is really important uh, for us to have on the front end so that we can effectively um, work, analyze a case and help provide meaningful insight. Okay, um, included with that should be any electronic medical records that were produced. I recommend giving them all at once. If the, the records total tens of thousands of pages, it's best to, to produce those at once so that they can be normalized, OCR'd, labeled appropriately, um, and keyword searched because many times we're not doing a linear review of every page of the records, but we're looking for important concepts. And if we only get the, the EMR piecemeal, then we often have to repeat all those searches again when we get the next batch of documents. <clears throat> so with the EMR, uh, making that data efficient to review is going to help not only the attorneys, paralegals, and medical experts, but it's really key uh, to be able to make sense of these cases, uh, to have the data OCR, to have the data put into a spreadsheet format where possible, identifying the key events and providers, uh, looking for the key dates, um, workers and concepts, when the data is normalized, it's easy to quickly filter out what's not relevant, remove dates not of interest, and zoom in on those key dates and times when things or allegations of improper care uh, took place. Um, with, with the EMR, it's not uncommon that we'll, we'll create, uh, we'll take all the, the documents we've received and split them up into a single file per page that are all labeled um, but that we can then search for and assemble, uh, for instance, a, a PDF that references care provider A or a specific medication or procedure. It's sometimes easier to review tens of thousands of documents if you're doing it on a concept basis. <clears throat> so the in-person direct access um, is what, what often is required to be able to get uh, a complete view of what happened because some of the data doesn't show when you're just looking at the produced printed charts, uh, such as routing history, what the notes look like at different points in time, and access to inactive or deleted records. Uh, communications, as I mentioned, um, here's some screenshots from some popular HIS systems that follow. So this is EPIC, and here you see the notes view. And when you're entering into the system, there's routing, which can give you additional detail about what happened in terms of the routing of the notes. Um, you have a, a note time, a file time, and a note time. In this case, all these records, with the exception of um, this one down here, the 1024, 1004 AM note time was filed 
uh, 15 minutes later. Uh, so it's important to have both date and timestamps because sometimes the file times are many days after discharge or uh, nowhere contemporaneously to the events. And, and that's important if notes are being entered into this EMR days after something awful happened, you really want to know when those notes were filed. Uh, if they're filed long after things went wrong, um, oftentimes that su suggests uh, that fabrication of the EMR took place. You can see here, here's some of the routing. Uh, it allows for you to specify different recipients. And so knowing that routing of information, that's important because it's not always evident when you're looking at the chart. Here's an example of adding a note. And you can see here, uh, there's ability to copy and paste different notations. The date and time on these notes, when you first go to create a note, they default to the current computer's clock time. But um, it's totally possible to change the date and time to put it uh, back in time by dates or hours. And uh, that information is relevant. Here's an example of the Cerner uh, notes. Again, Cerner allows the user to change the date to something other than the current date and time. And it still stores, again, the creation time of that note, even if the note purports to be days earlier. And there's also uh, different filters here. Uh, when you're looking at the EMR with power notes and Cerner, uh, there's different filters such as my notes only, uh, there's inactive, active, and, and so on. So directly accessing the, the software can provide more details. Here's an example in Cerner of adding notes. And you can see um, there's text reports, there's different types of notes. Um, there's notes that have a status of cancel. Uh, those notes could be very relevant um, or inactive notes might be relevant as well. But if you're directly interacting with the software, you can click that expand detail button and you can see more. And so some of that detail is important, has to be captured on site with a, a video camera or, or photo um, camera shots of the records. You can see here, uh, there's documents entered in and it shows a completion date and time it shows the author, it shows when the document was last updated. Well, that's additional detail that you often don't receive in the printed production of patient EMR. But it's highly relevant to know not only the time of service, which can be selected at will by the person entering it, but when it was last updated. And because if you have uh, the record was updated days after discharge when something went wrong, that's very relevant. And you wanna be able to know the revision history. So in Cerner, when you're interacting and looking at the consult notes, you can actually clip on the date and time at the left, and you'll see the revision history of the note. So this particular note shows a, a history, what it looked like on October 30th, 2017 at 7.56 a.m. The next page shows what it looks like the day before. So I'm going to flip back. You can see that basically an addendum was added. And addendums are... Um, when a note is, is signed, it becomes read-only locked down. So you have to uh, insert what's known as an addendum for signed notes. Uh, notes aren't signed immediately in many cases. Usually supervising nurse or physician might want to review it before the note is signed. But in any event, the, the revision history is available and you can see it when you're interacting with the, the system directly. Okay, so Meditech, here's a, a screenshot of what Meditech looks like. And in here, you can see that there's um, various screens. There's draft, there's sign. Again, the date and time can be altered as desired, uh, but it still stores the actual date and time in the back end. Here's a, a listing of notes. You can see the date and time. You can see the status of if it's signed. But when you're interacting with the system, you can click it, you can view details, you can see history and so on. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the overview and process of working one of these cases with electronic medical records such as myself. I typically 
<clears throat> cases start off with the need to make the request for the complete electronic medical record. Oftentimes, attorneys contact us when this has already been done, but they suspect that the data is deficient in some way or fabricated. So we often will review the records produced, uh, identify examples or problems with filters, anything that looks um, suspect, and then assist with drafting a supplemental request to produce. If the supplemental materials are produced, we review that, we look for deficiencies in the records, and oftentimes there will still remain deficiencies. So in that case, we have to spend time analyzing the EMR and working on a report of sorts that shows examples of what's missing. And at that point in time, we're trying to compel the judge to order an inspection. You know, on the converse side, uh, if we're working for the hospital, we'll be looking through the EMR and often reporting to them whether or not there was fabrication by hospital staff. And that's important for insurance carriers because they want to understand what their risk is if they litigate a case to trial. And it may be more advantageous to simply settle the case if, um, if there's some problems in the EMR. So after we've drafted a motion to compel, um, well, typically we write an affidavit in support of a motion to compel an on-site direct inspection. That motion gets filed by the attorney with our affidavit attached. And then there's a hearing. Uh, these days, the hearings tend to be on Zoom telephonically. Um, and oftentimes the judge will ask questions. You know, essentially when we're doing an on-site, what we want is we want to be able to see the entire record of the patient as the physician can see it, the communications between providers and the complete revision history. Uh, this often requires videoing or taking photos of the data to capture data that's not easily printed from current reports with the, the HIS system. So when the on-site inspection happens, um, it's not uncommon that there will be multiple experts there. Um, I've been uh, hired to observe an inspection by a plaintiff, uh, plaintiff counsel that is seeking to look at the EMR. In, in that role, I'm looking to just document and understand um, how they're requesting the data, whether data is being withheld uh, despite the on-site and to advise my client in terms of what the data is that was produced and whether there's any issues with it. Um, the on-site inspection isn't where the analysis happens. It's usually an effort to try to dump all the data out, um, run reports, make sure the settings are documented appropriately, and really that the only filter being used is the filter for the patient. There should be no other need to filter anything uh, those records are the patient's records. They have a right to that content. And, you know, this process is one that is going to become much more common as we continue uh, with the understanding of medical records and audit trails becoming more prevalent. So after the on-site inspection, there's a need to review that data, oftentimes normalize it again, compare it against earlier produced EMR. Um, that analysis might document that early on that the healthcare organization was, you know, willfully holding back information that was key and important. And so in instances where that happens, there's a need to write a report to document those changes or deficiencies. And before, long before trial happens, um, and a report's issued, um, the, the expert witness that you use as your EMR expert will have to be deposed most likely. And what I usually find, at least in cases I've been involved with, is that the cases typically settle after the deposition. Because at that point in time, you know, you're really looking at what does a factual record reflect? There's not so much opinions so much as there are uh, facts. In some cases, there are opinions about, you know, why, you know, why does the chart show lots of entries that all were created days after discharge and they're all on rounded hours with no minutes in a situation like that, you know, my opinion would be that's likely fabrication because usually if you're entering notes and other procedures contemporaneous to events, 
you're going to have a randomization of the minutes and everything is not going to be stacked up at zero zero minutes on the hour. So if if a case is going to trial, there's a need to, to prep your EMR expert to let them review review the timeline, uh, their earlier affidavits, and the data that was collected so that they're prepared for trial. Um, in most cases, though, uh, cases tend to settle, and they usually settle after the on-site inspection and collection of data. Uh, sometimes it, they'll settle much earlier. Um, I've seen cases settle as soon as I get involved and help with writing a request for supplemental production. But uh, sometimes the cases go on further. Um, my experience, the further along through this process, the plaintiff gets, if we're able to identify willful uh, withholding of, of records, the settlement offer tends to, to be much higher. So I gave an overview of this. Um, there's slides here that I'll walk through. Um, I want to have plenty of time for questions. So I'm not going to read each of these, but um, in summary, you want to make sure that you're getting all the data. Um, and there's an outline here for um, if you email kathy.hurley at enigmaforensics.com, she can send you a complimentary sample request for EMR that helps you form that request. Uh, obviously, you may want to retain us to help you tweak that for your specific circumstances. It's a good idea though to ask for the user manuals when you're doing this process. And you wanna make sure that you're clear about asking for the complete revision history. So I talked about the review of the records produced and typically we're trying to identify examples of withheld records or other things that we can find or prove that are deficient from the production. Um, audit trails that lack a definition of what was being changed is an example. Um, production of data in a non-usable format, you know, going on site to have it exported so it's not produced in a crazy out of order duplicative format is often helpful. So when we're asking for the records that we're missing, we want to be specific on that and ideally pose that directly to opposing counsel um, in an email so that it's documented. And that way, if you're hearing a motion, you can show the judge that you've already tried to be specific about what you were asking for. It should always include the revision history. That phrase is so important. Uh, usually that's missing from productions. And it's often the case that even though you ask for things correctly, that it still isn't produced as requested. So having that um, clear documentation of asking for it in email is important. So when the supplemental production comes in, you know, we want to typically look at that quickly, try to see if they complied or failed to address certain sections. If they failed to disclose their filters or they filtered things differently than requested, you want to create a paper trail and send a follow-up email asking for that. And then if they don't comply, that's going to help you with your motion to compel when appearing in front of the judge. So the affidavit that we're generating is typically outlining these deficiencies. It might be sharing um, exhibits that include the emails that you sent asking for the data. We want to make sure that we've detailed the foundation for the request, um, pointing out examples of what was asked for, what was produced, how that was deficient, um, giving examples where the revision history showing changes is important. Um, you know, specifically the lack of when the records were actually created or last updated, and who updated them when, that information is very important. And it's often not in the initial round of production of EMR. So the filing the motion to compel the on-site inspection of EMR, there's a useful case out of Kentucky, Western District of Kentucky, the Boren versus Smith case. Um, I think on our website, if you search at enigmaforensics.com for Borum, B-O-R-U-M, there's a hyperlink to this case. 
And it's a federal case that lays out the arguments establishing and overcoming objections uh, made by a hospital resisting an on-site inspection. So this can be very useful uh, to lay a groundwork for uh, arguing your motion to compel. When that motion to compel hearing is held, having someone like myself there to be able to answer questions of the judge, um, overcome objections, help to establish protocols for the exam to ensure that it's effective and not uh, a waste of everyone's time is important. You know, recording of the HIS software uh, should be allowable, you know, an agreement to redact or call out anything that might have been captured that doesn't relate to the patient is something that I see there's no issue to, but the ability to document and record is critical. Um, ideally, during this on-site, you want to be able to reproduce what they produced previously so that you can confirm whether or not they, they had filters applied to it. If their earlier production of EMR only include active records and no uh, historical records, producing it in a more complete manner will help you to demonstrate to the court that the hospital was holding back important records that, you're, that were your patients or your clients' records that they have a right to. So again, making sure that inactive historical versions are included in the production of EMR is very important. So inspection on site during the pandemic, a lot of things have shifted to Zoom or WebEx. Uh, that can certainly happen. And on site inspection does have advantages, though. And I usually recommend the on site uh, where possible. Uh, now that vaccine, vaccines are widely available, um, the concerns over going on site should be much less. You're, during this inspection, I always recommend that the healthcare provider's IT person with admin rights actually be the person that's typing at the keyboard, moving the mouse, but at the direction of the requesting party. Um, that helps protect from you know, any potential harm to the hospital information system and really uh, should allow for a full um, observation of the EMR as it exists within the system. Uh, typically data is exported to external media and at the conclusion of that, um, the data is shared with um, producing party and requesting party subject to um, the right for either party to uh, deem data confidential or redact, uh, which typically you know, the confidentiality requirements, hospitals are already following that for the most part. Um, so really, as long as the, the, the data is restricted to the, the patient, um, you know, there really shouldn't be much reason to hold back data that belongs to a patient, as long as it's just that patient's data. That data will be examined after the on-site when there's time to analyze it. So after the on-site, you know, that's when there's more time to look at the data, to analyze it, to compare it. Um, you know, if, if there's an expectation that smoking guns were captured during the on-site, sometimes um, if a plaintiff expert might want to uh, just hold off for a week or two if they think that a settlement's likely so that the costs aren't incurred. I discussed the comparison of initial productions versus what was collected on site. Um, you know, trying to identify examples of manipulated records or previously withheld records can be important in understanding um, what happened with the, the case. So whether or not uh, you write a formalized report or just disclose some of the smoking guns, that's a decision that uh, plaintiff counsel often considers uh, Defense counsel often needs to consult with their insurance carrier um, and have someone like me help tell them what the situation is so that they can decide, is it, does the case have merit or um, 
should you proceed to trial and not uh, make a settlement. So the final report that gets written up, again, details examples of previously withheld information, examples of fabrication or manipulation of information, and trying to clarify, you know, in human words, a storyline of what took place. So when the deposition phase occurs, it's important that your expert uh, be able to survive a, a, a Daubert challenge. You, you don't want to have all the work tossed out because the collection of data was um, not done properly or not performed by someone that has appropriate experience. It's important to try to avoid mistakes, which, uh, you know, sometimes typos happens and whatnot, but trying to minimize um, mistakes typically requires uh, giving your expert time to review and proof their, their report having other peer review processes performed and engaging with your expert to make sure that um, everything is clear and understandable. And ultimately you're trying to establish a foundation to admit important information uh, that relates to EMR uh, so that you can clarify what events took place and having your expert be able to explain that to a judge is really important. So one of the things you want to look for when you're uh, picking an expert, you want to look for identifying an experienced expert that has testified on cases before and is capable of taking technically complex information and presenting it in an easy to understand manner. And that is, isn't always easy for many technical geniuses out there that understand a lot of uh, complex information. You want to make, make sure again that your your expert has time to refresh and review the materials before trial um, experts that are busy are going to be on many different cases and shifting between one med mail uh, case matter and another involving emr you know takes uh, takes some time to shift so i like to try to work on a case solidly for a period of time get it up to a report finish that and then come back to a case at the next checkpoint so that I can focus and not be split between two uh, similar but different cases. And as I said before, most cases never make it to trial because ultimately the electronic medical records, if obtained and produced in their entirety with the date and time that they were entered and modified and whatnot, that data will typically speak for itself. So um, whether you're defending a case or uh, pursuing one, getting an understanding of the events that took place is highly critical. So when we find examples of manipulation of information, settlement agreements are usually reached because if a hospital took a case to trial and it was proven that they manipulated the records, they would face far more litigation from other plaintiffs as a result of that. In some cases, some of the, uh, the outcome might not be uh, to have a case settlement. It might be to, to, for a parent to regain custody of their child because there were inappropriate allegations of harm that aren't substantiated by the electronic medical record. If you can prove that healthcare provider purposely withheld information, it's, it's really, um, really helpful to getting a settlement or a favorable outcome if you're on the plaintiff side. And as again, as I said, what I've seen is the highest settlement offers usually come if you prove willful fabrication or manipulation of EMR. And I had a case uh, back in, I think it was around 2004 involving um, a heart catheterization operation that went wrong and days after the operation, the patient was discharged and then passed away. And it's an unfortunate circumstance that left a family with one fewer parent, um, one less parent. Um, in that case, though, um, years after the accident, the surgeon produced a CD disc that contained the video clips documenting the surgery. But what happened when I examined the CD, 
I was able to establish that the CD had been created a month previously. The CDs have headers that show the date and time that they're created by a specific computer. Uh, furthermore, I looked at the, the video clips. There were DICOM video files. DICOM is Digital Imaging and Communication of Medicine. And these video files had embedded metadata that showed the sequence number and the date and time and length of the clip. Well, what had happened is I think it was clip six, seven, and eight were deleted, and nine, 10, and 11 were renumbered to be six, seven, and eight. So there were three video clips that were removed. And then the renaming of the, their files effectively made it look like the deleted clips never existed. Well, in doing forensics on that, I was able to establish what had happened. And then during my, my deposition, I testified to that. At the end of it, the um, attorney for the hospital asked me, do you have any proof that the hospital had anything to do with this? Uh, keep in mind, the, phys the surgeon was the one who produced the CD years after the operation. Well, my reply to uh, the attorney for the hospital was, if given the opportunity to examine the hospital's equipment, I could determine whether or not the CD that was produced was, was generated by their equipment. And my deposition ended quickly after that. They asked for my business cards. And then um, the maximum settlement of the insurance um, coverage from both the, the surgeon and the hospital, uh, that offer was made in the case settlement. So it was a favorable outcome. Um, one other thing too, in many cases that have caps on liability, if the plaintiff is able to prove willful manipulation, in some states, those caps go away. So if you're defending a hospital in one of these cases, having someone like myself help you determine if the EMR shows willful manipulation or fabrication, that can be very important because exposure uh, to the hospital could be much greater than in a case where um, things simply, you know, mistakes happen. And unfortunately, uh, mistakes happen and uh, good people uh, suffer harm as a result of disease, surgeries and whatnot. Um, but in situations where bad things happen and then individuals in a healthcare organization take efforts to fabricate the record to make it look other than what it really what events really took place, that can be very risky for a healthcare provider. And knowing that early on into a case it is really important that hospitals know that and other healthcare providers. So in those situations, um, I've had a lot of experience digging in and answering those questions quickly before the plaintiff gets their answers. I've also helped the plaintiff get the answers to those questions and reach satisfactory settlements. So we're now at the Q&A phase of this. And um, I'll, Kathy, if you'd email uh, our business card that have our email uh, contact details and other information to everyone through the chat window, that would be great. And then um, I'm gonna stop my screen share so that we can do some Q and A. Let's see. Okay. Okay, Kathy, do we have any um, any questions out there? Hi, Lee. Very good. Um, lots of useful information. Hi, Kathy, your your microphone isn't on. I can't hear you. Oh, go ahead. I had turned mine off. Yeah. Um, there you are. Lisa, Sorry about that. Uh, we have uh, Lisa who is asking, what is the best way to word a request to ask for the audit trail? Could you repeat that one more time, please? What is the best way to word a request to ask for our audit trail? Well, I think, um, you know, the, the sample EMR questions, if you email... Uh, Kathy, she can send you those samples. And we have some of the language that, that lays that out. But you want to ask for the audit trails, you want to ask for the revision history, you want this information from any and all connected hospital information systems, whether it's the radiology PACS system, or the 
anesthesiology records. Um, you know, there are anesthesiology information systems that monitor um, blood pressure, um, oxygen saturation levels, and other information during um, a surgery. And you have to you have to learn about the hospital or a healthcare provider to understand what systems they're using. And, you know, part of what we do when we help someone uh, on the plaintiff side is we're researching the hospital to figure out what's their systems. You know, there's a lot of information publicly out there on their website uh, that can be found on LinkedIn and so on. And so when we uncover what, what software packages are in use, we can rely on our experience working with those different systems to help formulate the request in a much more tailored way. So I hope that answered the question. Great, thank you, Lee. We have another question from Lisa. In a nursing home or med mal case, if I request to produce, ask for the medical records or chart, is it worthwhile to ask for the electronic medical records? In other words, does asking for an EMAR produce anything different? Well, what, what I find is that you have to ask for the records a lot of different ways or else yeah you know what i see a lot is there's a minimal response to produce something but it isn't everything and that's really i mean that's why plaintiffs need need me to be able to look at it and say oh you produced the chart but i don't see any uh progress notes for right. the physician or you know where are the where are the records of the patient vitals? You know, all this information adds up. If, if you've got a nursing home situation, they're often tracking when they're, they're giving medications, uh, when they're administering baths or, or changing diapers or when stool counts are there. And so this information might seem not important, but if you're getting into neglect, knowing when, um, someone in a nursing home is receiving care and whether or not those care records are being entered in after an injury happened. Like if someone slips and falls and it's someone that was experiencing dementia and they required a certain level of care, if the chart doesn't show regular attendance and care, and then, or it shows that there were, someone was checking on the patient every three hours on the hour, well, it's not likely that the check-ins are going to be exactly in the hour. They're probably going to be a few minutes off if they're entered in contemporaneously. But more important than the record, the reported record of care is when those records were actually created or updated or viewed in the system. Because if they were all created after a bad event. event happen, then right. you've got fabrication, which throws away a lot of the limitations on liability. So that's something that plaintiff or defense counsel, you want to know that because if fabrication can be proved or, or it can be proved that someone doctored up the record after something went wrong, it's in your interest to know that sooner than later. Thank you. Um, one more question. And by the way, if anyone has any more additional questions they would like to ask, please insert that in the Q&A and um, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Lisa also is asking, what are the approximate range of costs to get someone like you involved in this case? And this is important when assessing whether or not it's worthwhile to get an expert involved, depending on the case's value. We get asked this quite a few times, don't we, Lee? Yeah, and, and yeah. You know, it's, not, it's not necessarily, cheap to do this you know we have a minimum project engagement of thirty five hundred dollars uh, to take on a matter um, i've had cases where we're retained we look at the information we point out some deficiencies and they disclose that i'm working for them as an expert and they take a quick settlement it really depends on you know the plaintiff involved uh, sometimes you have plaintiffs that want the truth to come out and they want the healthcare organization to pay for fabricating the record. And those cases cost much more. 
So I, I would say generally, if you're looking to get through the stage of where we have an affidavit to, to you know, appear and file a motion to compel, you know, before on site, it's, it's not uncommon that that takes anywhere from on the low end 8,000 to moderate end, maybe 15,000. It really depends on, you know, how, how much data is there? How, how many pages of content? Um, or, or how much you want to dig for? Well, but answer. also how, yeah. how willing the other side is to fight if the hospital continues to, you know, mislead and produce mm -hmm. erroneous information, then you have to get in front of the judge. And every judge is different, but most judges will allow you to have greater access for the EMR if you can demonstrate that there's something missing. Right. So right. I, I wish I, I wish I could have a crystal ball to tell you what a case is going to cost. But, you know, on the high end, you know, high end going through the trial and whatnot, that could end up costing $50,000 or, or more. Um, I haven't seen cases that I've been involved with go past deposition. And, you know, generally speaking, you know, I think getting to the point of getting the records, that's what's important for winning your right. case. If the records speak for yourself, you don't need someone like me to testify at trial. And that's usually what happens. So, and, you know, with every case, with every case, I get better at this and I learn more and more about the software and it, it becomes quicker to get the records. Like if you're working with Cerner, I, I know all the games played with Cerner, same thing with Epic and, and many of the others that I've worked with. Uh, one other question, Lee. How do you handle a hospital who uses a third party to generate their records? Say the third party claims that they gave you everything and states, just tell us what you're missing. And then it's like, oh, well, sorry, it's not our fault. The third party didn't give us everything. How do you handle that? Well, again, it's looking at what was produced. If, for instance, you know, the Epic software, when you produce the progress notes, there's an option to produce it with a view that shows, um, typically it will show the initials of the username and it will have like 1.1. And then there will be a chart that says revision history. And it will tell you when the paragraph that or sentence that ends with MM 1.1 what date and time that was entered. And so when you're looking at the notes, you can kind of visualize and break apart what the revision history is. But I've seen other productions where that is missing. So in a situation, even if it's a third party, you still have a need to document that, okay, you produce this, the software has the capability to do it this way, either redo it or give us direct access. And, you know, having someone knowledgeable of the software is really critical to be able to get the judge's attention to order that on-site inspection. And, but it's not, it's totally common for, you know, hospitals from my experience to play a game of shifting the blame, obfuscating, and trying to delay given production of the complete revision history. Right. So here, here's a continuation to that question, Lee. So do you end up serving both the hospital and the third party again to get everything? How would you handle that? Well, again, with the, after analyzing what the deficiencies are, before you file a motion, it's good to put on record the email, subpoena or other, the request for the things that are deficient. If you've got a case file and you don't understand what's deficient, about your EMR, that, that's really where we come in. We can help you identify examples of things that are incomplete or apparently withheld. Right. So um, we're 12.59, we're right within that lunch hour. The, um, any parting words you'd like to say to our audience? Yeah, uh, just if you have an interest in being, um, if you have another colleague that's interested in the seminar, please uh, email Kathy. Uh, we might try to post it online on videos so people that weren't able to watch it could see it later. Um, and uh, please fill out the comment card if you can, if you have constructive suggestions about uh, how to improve this presentation, or if there's other specific topics you'd like to have a delve into, 
um, please include that and your feedback's appreciated. So. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye.